Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we are doing unemployment and inflation. In assessing the level of economic activity in a country, economists look at a variety of statistics. Besides GDP, one of the best known statistics that economists are interested in is your unemployment rate. Each month, Statistics Canada conducts a labor force survey of about 56,000 households. And each person in a household who is 15 years of age or older is placed in one of three categories. The first one is you are employed only if you are working full time or part time. The second possibility is that you are actively looking for a job but unable to find one and therefore you are considered unemployed. Note the term actively looking for a job. Here we are considering only those people as unemployed who have made some effort to look for a job in the past four weeks. So if you were looking for a job but that was more than four weeks ago, you are not considered unemployed by our labor force survey. The third category is that you are 15 years of age or older but you are neither unemployed nor employed and therefore you are not part of the labor force. Labor force is the sum of your total number of employed and the total number of unemployed. Labor force participation rate is a very key statistic and it is simply the percentage of the working age population in the labor force. So we'll calculate it by dividing the labor force by your adult population or your working age population. Remember these are people who are considered capable of working. It's a key indicator for analyzing how much of your adult population is actively participating in the labor force. We also often calculate the women participation rate and the men participation rate. The women participation rate is calculated by dividing the number of women in the labor force by the number of women in the working age population. Similarly, we can also calculate the male participation rate and that would be the number of males in your labor force divided by the number of males in your working age population. Remember, working age population population or adult population is your population of age 15 and older. The unemployment rate is the percentage of the labor force that is unemployed. So that is calculated by looking at the number of unemployed divided by the labor force times 100. Note that employment rate is not a percentage of the labor force. In fact, employment rate is the percentage of your working age population. So I can write the formula for employment rate as number of employed divided by your working age population. So if your unemployment is 10%, it does not mean that your employment rate is 90% because they are calculated as percentages of completely different categories. Let's look at this example and see if you can calculate the unemployment rate. It's a good idea again to pause the video and calculate it on your own and then check your answer if it matches mine. Now in this question, you have to do some intuitive thinking because data is not directly given to you. All we know is that total number of employed workers are definitely 95 and we do not know what the labor force is. Neither do we have any information that is directly telling us about a number of unemployed. So let's look at the numbers that are given to us. We have 210 million people as our total civilian population. People incapable of working, so we can assume them to be under the age of 15, are 50 million. Then we also have people who are not looking for work. So they could be of age 15 and older, but they are definitely not part of the labor force. So I'll use the method of deduction in order to get to my number of unemployed. So I have a total civilian population of 210. I know these 50 million cannot be considered unemployed because they are incapable of working. I further know that an additional 60 million can never be considered unemployed because they are not even looking for work. And lastly, the 95 million that are employed can obviously not be unemployed. So my overall number of people that are unemployed is 5 million workers. So these 5 million as a percentage of my labor force will give me my unemployment rate. So if my unemployed are 5 million and employed are 95 million, my total labor force is simply 100 million. And that gives me my unemployment rate of 5%. Note that I calculate a labor force as my employed plus unemployed which is giving me 100 million workers over here. I can also use this example to calculate the employment rate and the labor force participation rate. The official unemployment rate is measured with a high level of sophistication in accordance with guidelines established by the International Labor Organization. However, this official rate has been criticized primarily because it ignores certain type of workers. The first type of workers that it ignores are your discouraged workers. Discouraged workers are workers who are not looking for work because of the state of the economy. They believe that even if they were to look for a job, they will be unable to find one. They are not considered unemployed. Typically, we see that in a recession, the number of discouraged workers will steeply rise. The next category we have is of marginally attached workers. These are workers who these are workers who were available and had looked for a job recently but are not currently looking for a job. 
job. So these workers would be willing to work if they were to find a job today, but they have not looked for work in the past four weeks. Lastly, we have your underemployed or the underemployment. Underemployment refers to your involuntary part-time workers. So these are workers who are working part-time jobs, but would rather be working full-time jobs. As you can see, your official rate ignores all of these type of workers. If we were to include any one of these categories as unemployed, our official rate will jump up. So in my next example, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm using the same numbers that we had in our earlier example and total number of unemployed is five, employed are 95. So our current labor force is of 100 million people. And now let's assume that out of our civilian population, there are 5 million discouraged workers. Now these 5 million were initially not considered part of the labor force because they have not been looking for work in the past four weeks. They're completely discouraged by the state of the economy. If I was to now include them as unemployed, my unemployment rate will go up. And that's what I've done over here. You can see my unemployment rate goes up from 5% to 9.5%. Because they were not part of the labor force, they have both increased my denominator and my number of total unemployed. So overall, my unemployment rate rises to 9.5%. Similarly, I can assume we have 4 million marginally attached workers. Including these marginally attached workers as unemployed will increase my official level of unemployed from 5 to 9 and therefore increases my overall unemployment rate from 5 to 8.7 percent. Note again that I am only including the marginally attached workers and not including discouraged workers in this case. So my number of unemployed goes up from 5 to 9 and the rate increases from 5 to 8.7 percent. Lastly, I can also include my involuntary workers as my unemployed because these are workers who would rather be working full-time jobs but are stuck in part-time jobs. And let's assume these are 10 million workers. Now these 10 millions were initially included in my labor force because they were initially employed. Now we are considering them as our unemployed. So my labor force will remain the same because they were initially part of the labor force. However, my unemployed will now go up. So including them as unemployed increases my number of unemployed to 15, keeps my labor force the same and increases my unemployment rate from 5 to 15 percent. So significant increase over here. If I was to include all these three categories to my official unemployed of 5 million, you can see that our overall unemployment rate jumps up from 5 to 22.2 percent, which is significantly higher than what our official rate was telling us. So the official rate has a lot of problems. It's often criticized for being underestimating the true level of unemployment in our economy. Here we have the same story, but now we are working with actual data for Canada from 97 to 2017, and we have the official rate in orange, and then I'm gradually adding all of these categories of workers which were initially considered not unemployed. As you can see, for any given year, as we include these categories of workers to our official unemployed, our overall unemployment rate starts to go up and the actual level of unemployment given by the green line is a lot higher than our official rate given in orange. You can see in periods of recessions, unemployment rate will significantly go up. So in 2009, we have our big financial crisis and you can see the overall unemployment rate is going up regardless of which statistic we are using. Analyzing the unemployment rate, we find out that it is definitely not a perfect statistic. It has its drawbacks. It ignores all those categories of workers which are technically unemployed but are not considered to be so. It is also problematic because it does not look at the quality of jobs that workers are working and also doesn't look at the satisfaction level of workers. That's why economists not only just rely on the official rate, but also look at many other indicators to gauge the actual health of a labor market and of our economy. Some of these are your labor force participation rate, number of full-time jobs, and your average wages. So if your unemployment rate is going down primarily because of too many part-time jobs, it's actually not a good sign because these are not sustainable jobs and these people might be out of work a few months down the road. Let's now look at what we call the natural rate of unemployment. There is some unemployment that will always persist, even if the economy is otherwise healthy. And it is specifically the unemployment rate that persists even if the economy is performing at full potential. Full potential level of production refers to the level of your real GDP when all resources are being used efficiently. So your land, labor, capital are three broad categories of factors of production. All of these factors of production are performing efficiently. Now this statement over here is telling you that unemployment never goes to zero. Natural rate of unemployment is made 
up of two types of unemployment, which is your frictional and structural unemployment. And looking at each one of these individually will help us explain why is there always some unemployment even when the economy is at full potential. Frictional unemployment is the unemployment due to the time workers spend in job search. There can be two reasons for high frictional unemployment. First one is the scarcity of information. The more scarce the information available to workers and prospective employers, the longer it will take workers to get employed. Secondly, matching people to the jobs that they like takes time. So I could be willing to work, but it may be some time before I find the ideal job matching my particular skill set. Therefore, we'll always see some frictional unemployment persisting in our labor market. The second reason for natural unemployment to be positive is your structural unemployment. This is when you have more people looking for jobs than the number of jobs available at the current wage rate. Now this current wage rate is typically higher than the market clearing wage rate and because it's higher than the market clearing rate, we see the number of workers willing to work is typically higher than the number of jobs available. So here my QS is quantity supplied of workers and QD is my quantity demanded of workers. Given the demand supply framework for a labor market, we'll see how structural unemployment will always arise whenever the wage rate is higher than our market wage rate. Now, what could be the reasons for the wage rate to be higher? Some main reasons for structural unemployment are your minimum wage. So that is your government mandated price floor. Government is intervening in the labor market to ensure some basic standard of living for all workers. Here the intervention in the labor market for some equity concern. Secondly, we also see labor unions playing a huge role in creating structural unemployment. Now remember, labor unions have a lot of collective bargaining power. And with this collective bargaining power, they will push the wage rate much above the market clearing rate. And whenever the price is higher than the equilibrium market price, we saw in chapter three, it will create some excess supply. In this case, the excess supply will be of workers. The third reason for structural unemployment is when your firms themselves set the wage rate higher. Now, when the firms are setting the wage rate higher, we call it efficiency wage. And efficiency wage is primarily imposed in order to create incentive for workers to perform better. We see this in a lot of different sectors that firms themselves will be giving very high wages or very good salary packages in order to induce workers to perform better and also to attract and retain the best quality of workers. Lastly, we also see structural unemployment persisting in economies where governments give very generous social security safety nets. These social security safety nets could be in the form of very generous unemployment insurance benefits. CERB was introduced in Canada after the onset of the COVID-19 global pandemic. As the economy started going into a slowdown, a lot of workers were losing their jobs. In order to provide some relief to workers who were losing jobs, Government of Canada introduced very generous CERB payments. Now, because of these CERB payments, we saw some workers willingly not accepting jobs or preferring to be laid off. And that causes the structural rate and therefore the natural rate of unemployment to be going up. We can use a basic demand supply diagram to show structural unemployment. This is your traditional diagram for the labor market. On my x-axis, I have quantity of labor. Labor demand is downward sloping and it is representing the behavior of firms, which are the employers. And as you can see, lower the wage rate, the more number of workers are firms willing to hire. Higher the wage rate, quantity demanded of workers will go down as the wage rate is a cost for firms. So at higher wage rates, they're willing to hire less workers. Labor supply curve is representing the behavior of your workers. And as you can see, higher wage rate, workers are willing to work more, so quantity supplied of labor increases. And at lower wage rate, workers are not induced to work as much, and therefore the quantity supplied of labor decreases. The equilibrium in the market is where the two curves intersect and that gives us our equilibrium wage rate and the equilibrium quantity of workers. As you can see at equilibrium quantity demanded is exactly equal to quantity supplied. So neither there is a shortage nor a surplus in the labor market. Anyone who's willing to work has a job. However, if we were to impose a minimum wage in this market in the form of a government mandated price floor, this minimum wage is now above the market clearing wage rate. Why is it above? Because the government thinks this wage rate is not good enough. In order to ensure slightly better standards of living, government mandates a price floor in the labor market. Now, this higher minimum wage will cause both firms and workers to behave differently. At the higher minimum wage, more workers are willing to work, so quantity supplied of workers will increase. And at the same higher wage, firms are willing to hire less workers, as the higher wage is increasing their costs of production. So quantity demanded of labor decreases. With quantity supplied exceeding quantity demanded, we have surplus of labor in the market. This surplus of labor in our case will be defined as unemployment. Why? 
because because we have number of workers who are willing to work let's assume them to be 100 and the number of available jobs are only 70 so we have 70 million people with the job but 100 million people willing to work and that creates excess supply of labor of 30 million workers and this 30 million is basically your structural unemployment if the minimum wage was taken away then the market will go back to its market clearing rate however for as long as this price floor is in place it's now legally binding for all employers to pay at least this much we will have some structural unemployment in this labor market note that if you are at the market clearing wage rate there is no structural unemployment because quantity supplied is equal to quantity demanded so structural unemployment over here is zero it only arises when the wage rate is higher than the market clearing rate now the natural rate of unemployment which arises because of frictional and structural unemployment is not a static rate it will change as we see changes in the characteristics of our labor force so it can change because of our changing demographics labor market institutions can also have a huge impact on our natural rate so economies with very strong labor unions would typically have higher natural rates of unemployment with increases in technology in terms of how quickly you can post your resume and connect with different type of prospective employers we see frictional unemployment has gone down over time lastly remember government policies can increase structural unemployment but all changes in these government policies can also reduce our natural rate of unemployment so if governments invest in a lot of job training programs that will help match workers to the available jobs in that particular labor market we will see reduction in our structural unemployment rate and therefore in our natural rate of unemployment next we want to look at the relationship between the unemployment rate and the business cycle so we know some unemployment is natural so this one is always going to persist and it is arising out of frictional and structural unemployment however unemployment goes up and down along with the business cycle and we typically see unemployment goes up whenever the economy is in a recession and unemployment tends to go down when the economy is in a recovery or in a boom and this deviation of the unemployment from its natural rate is called cyclical unemployment for example if our our natural rate of unemployment is 4% and currently the overall unemployment rate is 6% that is telling you that 2% of this unemployment is caused because of business cycle recession. Typically remember it's the recessionary time period in which your actual unemployment exceeds your natural rate. Likewise whenever the unemployment rate is below your natural rate so for example we have 3% versus 4% your cyclical unemployment is now negative 1%. And this corresponds to your business cycle expansion. Why? Because as economy is recovering, overall unemployment is going down. And as it falls below the natural rate, it causes your cyclical unemployment to become negative. This lower growth causing this upward trend in your unemployment is typically caused because of two main reasons. Firstly, whenever GDP falls, a lot of firms will lay off workers, causing unemployment to overall increase. Secondly, we see that when you have idle labor and capital, overall the ability of the economy to create more jobs also decreases. As number of jobs have gone down for any given level of quantity supplied of labor, unemployment will naturally go up because all of these workers who are willing to work are now not able to find enough jobs, pushing the unemployment rate even further up. So, so far we have discussed three main types of unemployment frictional structural and then cyclical unemployment now next we're going to talk about inflation and towards the end of the chapter we'll discuss briefly the relationship between inflation and unemployment